What I found though is uh, sales translates directly to stress. And what I mean by this is sales is organizational obligation. I sell you something, now I am obligated to deliver that product or service. So that puts organizational stress on me. So more sales is more stress. The balance for this is profitability because profitability gives our business sustainability. I really am hesitant to pay any mind to revenue numbers. I, I go to these entrepreneurial events and people are like, I got a $1 million or I just surpassed two or I have a $300,000 business. I'm like, ah, great. I, that means nothing to me. Tell me about how healthy your business is. And that's when most people go zip lip and they're like, wow, I don't want to talk about that part. But that's the part that matters. <laughs> We stand today. The business method. The business with method. A shadow. The business method. The business method podcast. The business method podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars and annual revenue and now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results economies and cultures there's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method Hey, podcast listeners, welcome to the show today. We've got another exciting guest on the mic, one that um, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I know I say that a lot it's because we get so many great guests on the show, but uh, today we have Mike McCallowitz, and I really mean that when I say um, this is an episode, if you're an entrepreneur out there, this is an episode you should listen to. This is an episode you should listen to. I'll say it again. This is an episode you should listen to. And I'll tell you why. Um, I had heard about Mike. Mike is the author of numerous books, probably a lot that you've heard of. One of them is Profit First, is really popular these days. Then you have The Pumpkin Plan, Clockwork, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, Surge, and his newest book, Fix This Next. In each one of these books, it really seems like they solve massive problems that entrepreneurs are having. And Mike has what he calls the the entrepreneur, the business hierarchy of needs. And it starts with sales, then it goes to profit, then it goes to order, then impact, then then legacy. And what happens with so many entrepreneurs is we get mixed up. We start with sales. Actually, we start with legacy before we even start with sales or impact or order or profit before we even start with sales. And sales is the lifeblood of a business. Every successful entrepreneur will tell you that. And then in order to move and to grow into into you continuing to build this business, you need profit. Bottom line, you need profit. There's so many companies out there that are doing X millions per year and they're not profitable. Uber is a perfect example. Not profitable. What's going to happen with the company? Nobody really knows. It's out there. It has one of the largest networks in the world, but nobody really knows. Something is going to have to change eventually. So for the normal entrepreneur, we need sales first, then profit, then we need order. Uh, this is to uh, organize the business, get our SOPs going, get employees, um, have the business run itself. And then you can focus on impact and legacy. And that's where you truly can give back to the world. So, so many entrepreneurs have this confused. And in Mike's books, he addresses all of this and fix this next. He talks about these hierarchy of needs in the pumpkin plan. He talks about the sales part. Profit first is the profitability part and clockwork is the order and organizational part and then it goes along um, but in the podcast like it's such a great episode we have it both on video if you want to chill and watch it on youtube you can do that or just pop it in your headphones and, and listen to the episode it's good as well i could have spent another couple hours with mike um on uh with 
mic on the mic <laughs> on the microphone because it was just such a really, really good quality conversation. I was taking notes during the podcast. I immediately noticed problems in my business uh, just talking to Mike, and those are the most impactful conversations uh, that we can have. And if you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't mean if you sold. It doesn't matter if you've sold companies and you're investing with people, or you're going through the hustle and grind of building a company, or no matter what stage you're at, I really think you can learn something from Mike because it's so basic. It's so to the point. It's so clear and it's um, so really impactful for where we're at as entrepreneurs. That's what we're going to talk about on today's podcast. We'll talk about Mike's story. We'll talk about his books. We'll talk about these hierarchy and needs. We even talk about like how you can solve major business problems by looking in nature. And this is something that I've talked about for a while, uh, having an agriculture background, understanding the process of the harvest and the planting and the nurturing seasons. So you guys really, really enjoyed this episode. Subscribe and listen. Give us a review. Check out all the the courses and live events that we have going on these days. Um, And without further ado, let's hop into the podcast with the one and the only entrepreneur himself, Mike Michalowicz. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools, and tactics. By his 31st birthday, Mike Michalowicz had founded and sold two multi-million dollar companies, then decided to become an angel investor and lost it all. He started all over again, determined to help entrepreneurs grow healthy and strong companies by creating the profit first formula. Now Mike is running his third and his fourth million dollar ventures. Mike is a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal, is the former MSNBC business makeover expert, is a popular keynote speaker on innovative and entrepreneurial topics, and is the author of Clockwork, Profit First, The Pumpkin Plan, Fix This Next, Surge, and The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur which Business Week deemed as the Entrepreneur's Cult Classic. Mike is also a guest lecturer for the collegiate entrepreneurial programs such as Babson, Bob's Boston College, Columbia, Copenhagen Business School, Emerson, Harvard, Penn State, Pepperdine, and Princeton. And his books are in the core curriculum for entrepreneurial students at Pepperdine, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, and Stanford University, and universities all across the country. His books have been translated into 10 different languages and sold over a half million copies. And he's the host of the Entrepreneurship Elevated podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Michalowicz, welcome to the show. Wow. that What an intro. You got all the details. I think we're done. Yeah, I think we're done. And then we should just wrap it up, right? <laughs> what else is there to say? I mean, <laughs> well, I, I got a speaking gig at my old high school and I've, I've never been so nervous in my life. Uh, those are the ones that make you the most nervous too, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, you know, it's in the auditorium and I'm just ready for them to throw tomatoes at me, put cigarettes at all my chest. Like I'm just, like, terrified. <laughs> so how'd it go? Like what'd you talk on? I ha- oh, I haven't done it yet. It's, it's lined up uh, for like two months from now. I don't even like to talk about, you know, because I remember I was the kid there. Like, who is this jerk on stage? Like, so I don't, I don't know. I'm <laughs> well, I wish you much success because I actually have that, that dream in the back of my mind, like going back to my old university or going back to my elementary school and talking to the kids there, you know, so I, you know, it's funny. I do um, have like a, a vision board of things I want to do. And one thing I do want to be is the, uh, the closing speaker at my college um for the graduation and um that you know that's my long shot but i'd love to the, the high school is pretty cool uh but so intimidating I, I, did they reach out to you or did how you know, did they yeah yeah they reached out to me and they have an entrepreneurial program they've started at the school and they want to inspire that you know jobs are are a changing and uh you know what's the i went i went and toured the school once they said hey can you come back and do it i said yeah i'd love to see it and sadly a lot of the um, trades training, like I, I took wood shop, I took metal shop, electric shop to learn those skills. All of those are gone. I, there was a, I think the auto shop was still there, but everything else was gone. And uh, they replaced it with AI. So there's some cool, like you can do stuff, but a lot of trade skills are are going away. Yet the demand for it's increasing. Um, and how this school is responding is, is with AI, but also inspiring entrepreneurship. So you know, there's some sadness and there's some opportunity at the same time. So where are all the bad kids going to go smoke cigarettes if they have AI class and not wood shop? A non-smokers walk anymore. So we used to have a smokers. You, I can't believe it. The school called it smokers walk. Really? <laughs> but, yeah. And like everyone would go out there and smoke. But by the early 80s, that started to be curtailed. And when I went to high school, they they finally had stopped it fully. You weren't allowed to smoke on 
you know, campus. Yeah. We used to sneak out of wood shop class and smoke cigarettes behind, you know, the, the, the in outside the in, in the building. Yeah. Outside. Yeah, that's building. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> but, uh, but now I guess they have AI classes, but I don't know. Like it, it was, um, I don't know. Is it still cool for kids to smoke these days? Vaping is like, so I saw some kids vaping when I went there. And so it's so interesting because vaping is so, um, it's so cloaked. I mean, I, you don't even know. And all of a sudden someone just kind of leans down into their, their, uh, lapel and there's a big puff of smoke coming out you know cigarettes that you could just see it you know you had to carry it and and there's a distinct smell like vaping can smell like candy canes you know yeah it's like a sweet yeah 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 well let's uh hop into the show more i want to talk about you and get your story um so like this is what i'm i'm really interested in i, I want to get to know your backstory a bit because by the time you're 35 um you had built two multi-million dollar companies and then you got excited and wanted to be an angel investor and uh, I think this is common though with a lot of people you know they get a, a big payout and they don't know what to do with their money and so they put it in places and, and they lose it so tell us about your first two companies that you built and then that process of becoming an angel investor so uh, the first company was in computer networks computer systems I was the computer guy for a regional business I think we before I exited it's about $2 million in revenue. But let me just share this. Like you were so kind to share my intro, but it's all like the highlights. It's none of like the miserable stuff. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you were really stretching there. It's like, oh, uh, you know, he was in Copenhagen business school. It's true. It's true. Uh, but really, I think my resume highlights uh, barely even fills out a full page. I think you have to add like, you know, proficient in Microsoft Word, like to really get enough context in there. But uh, when I grew that first business, it was tons of struggle. It was tons of fear. I, I got married very young. I had my first son when I was 21. And like I had three mouths to feed. Um, yeah. And so the the fear was there. And the business was successful not because of acumen or skill, just panic. Um, not a good way to live. Um, it was never profitable either. It was only when I sold it. I sold it to a private equity when I made some money. Second business was in computer crime investigation. A business exploded because uh, the Enron trial broke about six months after I started that business and we got the Enron trial, not the entire thing. We got what's called defense analysis because uh, the CIA, FBI was doing the prosecution, but we got a lot of the analytical work and it put us on the map. It brought in tons of revenue and we started getting celebrity cases and all this stuff. I sold that, I had a partner, we sold it to uh, Robert Half International, it's a Fortune 500. I remember though, and this is I think the important part of my story is, the day I sold that business, all of a sudden I'm like, I'm God's gift to <laughs> entrepreneurship. I bought my own shit. I thought it was so smart. In retrospect, timing and luck is a big factor. Like I, I didn't make Enron happen. It happened. I happened to be next to the phone when that law firm was calling around getting people. And I was the first to answer and I was in. But I said, well, I'm clearly so smart. Two businesses built and sold. I'm going to become an angel investor and show all the world how smart I am. So I started throwing money at these businesses. They were young entrepreneurs in general. Uh, I didn't really so much care about them. I simply said, you have an idea. I'm the smart guy here. We're going to be rich. And I was this big, arrogant dick, like embarrassingly so. Then I lost all my money. And that, that was the awakening. That angel investment firm wiped, I wiped myself out. I also blew my money on personal effects. Like I wanted all the nice cars and I wanted the house in Hawaii. I did all that stuff. And, and, uh, but it didn't go bankrupt, but was on, was effectively technically bankrupt. My accountant even told me you should declare bankruptcy. I, I decided to dig my way out, but it was a long slog. Like it was like t a 10 year climb out. Um, but the greatest learning lesson. I had a, a similar experience. I didn't sell two multi-million dollar companies. But during the re uh, recession back in 2008, I went really, really broke. Uh, I had, yeah, me too. Right yeah, I had a 350Z that, you know, got repoed and couldn't pay my awesome. rent. I was living in Scottsdale, Arizona, you know, living the fancy life. And uh, and it was like one time I, I got my friend, I was at my friend's and I, he was like, are you really that broke? And I go, yeah, let's call my bank. I'll tell you. And the bank, um, the balance in it was like 25 cents. And yes. I was like, <laughs> you're really that broke. I was, uh, but you know, again, like that was the, one of the best 
learning lessons that I could ever go through and that process of rebuilding like made me so much better at managing money and everything and I, w- I wonder like I wonder if it brought you humility so appreciation yeah, right yeah me too yeah, absolutely me too. one time I was eating like a can of corn and a can of green beans for for dinner and I thought to myself one day I'm gonna I'm going to think back and laugh at this because this is going to be a learning lesson for me. Yeah. 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 So, um, so, okay. So then, so then you lost your money and talk about that rebuilding process for you. Cause that's really interesting. Um, first off, uh, maybe let's, let's touch on, um, um, cause I see a lot of entrepreneurs do this. They, they sell their companies or they have a bunch of money and they're not like, oh, I'm going to invest in these companies as well. So, so let's touch on that, that process for you, what you learned out of that and maybe give some entrepreneurs some, some tips and then we'll talk about the rebuilding process. Okay. So I decided to start an angel firm. Uh, it was like an incubator almost. I, I got a space, I hired people. And, uh, if you had a business idea for one of the business we brought on was, uh, uh, it was a uh, food delivery, prepared food delivery. So they would cook the foods, prepare it, uh, freeze it, and then ship it to you. And then you could prepare the meal over the next few days. Ultimately, uh, Blue Apron and those programs, they came about like seven, eight years later. Uh, they executed on it well. We executed on it poorly. Um, but that was one of the concepts. Another one was like a fitness product. It was actually a, a physical product, like a shaker for uh, shakes, uh, but like a special design, jewelry. What I the, one of the mistakes I made was first of all I uh, I went to disparate businesses they, there was no compliment so I couldn't I, I couldn't leverage contacts and networks like one, you know, one company needed all different services than than the other company so it was disparate and so it, I was actually stretching myself more and more. What I learned now is a business that's successful can and should drive profitability immediately and then scale based on that profitability. If, if I start a business, if I can't make that business profitable in the next like month or two after starting it, there's probably something fundamentally flawed. Now, I also realize, you know, you see the magazines and they're blanketed with these businesses that have skyrocketed in growth and success and are not profitable. I, I don't think those are profitable. I, I don't think those are successful businesses. Success is when you have profitability that brings about sustainability. So those businesses, they're big, but they're big stress a mess. I mean, I, I, I don't like that we exalt them to be the definition of a successful business. Most small businesses will never be in the cover of Inc. magazine, and we need to bring sustainability. So that's the first part we need to figure out. And I didn't. So these businesses, like, don't worry about being profitable. Let's just grow and sell and grow and sell. I mean, it's absurd now. And it, it was only about, it was 2008, right? So it was a recession. It was hard to sell that anyway. And it was by 2009, maybe 2010, the latest. But I think by 2009, I'd wiped myself out completely. So the, the, the funny thing is, I'm in my home office. I'll see, I think I have it here. I do, I do. I, um, this was the turning point. I actually physically have it right here. Now you'll see the first page. This is a, uh, a journal I started. And it used to say, I put black tape over here. I think it says, my successes. When I started this real struggle, I, I started to write down and uh, I, I started to believe that I got to start being more positive and optimistic. Every day, I'm going to write down like a success. And, uh, you know, I, I'm listed on, I, li- I add an entry to Wikipedia about myself. It literally, it's on here. Um, I interviewed a college preneur. I had 37 book sales. So I was just writing down all of these successes saying this is going to motivate me. And it wasn't. And, um, one day, I was actually, I went through depression. Um, I had what I believe to be functional depression. I removed myself from my social setting. I started drinking a lot. I don't really like to drink too much. I do enjoy a glass of wine. Um, I was meeting with a friend of mine and he goes, um, <clears throat> are you journaling? I said, yeah. And, and uh, he goes, are you journaling the right way? I'm like, I don't understand what you mean. He goes, any thought that comes to mind is what you need to write down. He goes, a journal is a relief valve. Uh, you aren't, you know, you're suppressed. You're, you're excluding yourself from society. You better get this stuff out. Otherwise the steam will continue to build. And you can see as, I, as it goes in deeper here, um, you know, now I start just writing whatever. And, uh, you know, I don't even want to look at it cause it's some nasty thoughts and anger and frustration, but this became the turning point for me was write down something that I feel angry or want to vent. And once I was done writing it, 
all of a sudden there was a sense of relief. And sometimes the relief was like for five seconds and the anger would build again, other times five minutes and sometimes a few days. And that then gave me focus and the ability to start marching forward consistently. What I also discovered was all these beliefs I had about business were not necessarily right. That I didn't, and I still don't really understand entrepreneurship fully. There's so much to learn. I thought I knew it and mastered it. So I started writing down these things I didn't understand and actually started to become books. And then I became an author. And that's what I do full time now is I, I'm devoted to studying entrepreneurship because I really don't know a lot. And I want to find the, the appropriate solutions for my own businesses and then share them with other people that are interested in, in discovering them. As I was going through your books, what I can really appreciate about them is it seems like you're solving the major problems for entrepreneurs in every single book. Like each one is like um, touching on a major pain point for us that we go through on a regular basis. And, and you take it through, uh, this may be a good time to touch on the entrepreneurial hierarchy of needs that, that you've created. And, it, and each book kind of touches on one of those subjects, right? Is that, that's how it's designed? Yeah. Each one touches on it. And actually I know we're going to talk about my new book. Uh, we're talking about talking about my new book, but my new book actually reveals this hierarchy and uh, the entrepreneurial hierarchy of needs. Um, now I'm calling it actually the business hierarchy of needs because really what it is, it's the hierarchy specific to what a business has. And I believe there's a, um, a common DNA among all business, just like all humanity. You know, if we peel back, not literally, but if we peel back our skin, um, we will discover that you and I have almost an identical makeup. And this is true for any human being. 99% of humanity is the same. It's only the outward elements and a couple of things inside. Well, business, um, even though as much as we want to say our business is unique, nothing, no one else is like me, it's 99% the same. We all have certain needs. So I took this and made a, uh, the business hierarchy of needs. And this also translates into um, or was derived from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He was studying the human makeup and said that the base level of survival is what we have uh, these things called physiological needs. We need to breathe air. We need to drink something, coffee this time in the morning, but you know, we need liquid, we need food. And only once those things are satisfied adequately, can we move to the next level of needs, which is safety. Like we need to have a shelter around us. We, we want to avoid physical harm financial stress. Um, and that's why actually so many people, when you don't have money, you feel that overwhelming panic. That's a physiological response or a biological response, I should say, to a safety need. But once our safety is satisfied, then we want and need belonging to experience relationships, loved ones, and so forth. And it keeps going up. The highest level he has is self-actualization. Well, I translated this to business and business has a foundational need of sales. Sales translates to a source of cash flow. It, it's this, the creation of cash. That's the blood of a business. That's the core essence need. The next level up is profitability. And profitability translates to sustainability. It's, it's not how much you make, it's how much you take. And if you can take more or reserve more, the business has more strength to it. It's actually at these two levels I find many businesses get confused. Because as a business owner, we're not neurologically wired into our business. Like, you know, Chris, you're neurologically wired into your own body just as I am. And if you or I are walking down a dark alley and you get the heebie-jeebies, like, oh my God, what's, what's going on? I don't feel comfortable here. That's a biological response from all your inputs, hearing, sight, smell, sixth sense. And you're, you should leave that dark alley. You probably will get hurt. So leave. The thing is, we're not wired into our business. Yet we have the same response. Saying, you know, just, something's wrong uh, here. I need to sell more. And that may not be the appropriate response because we're not wired into our business. Yet, most business owners under duress say, I need to sell my way out of this. <clears throat> you know, we don't, we don't have any money. I'm not, I can't support my own lifestyle. We got to sell more. Um, we had a bad month last month. Let's have a discount this month to just sell more. And what we're basically saying, if we go back to Maslow, Maslow is saying the foundation is breathing air. The next level up is um, safety, shelter, and so forth. That's like saying, I'm freezing to death in the cold here because I don't have any jacket on. I'm going to start breathing for air to warm myself up <sighs> and just doing this, expecting that to warm us up, but it won't. We need to get some kind of clothing around us quickly. Same thing with, with our business. We are gasping for air when we should be focusing on profitability. 
So that's the first two levels. Next level up is, um, is uh, my, my order or efficiency. It's the creation of efficiency, making the business uh, move on its own or, or, or grow on its own without dependency on the owner. And I am not saying that efficiency doesn't matter at all times. It just becomes a concentrated effort. Like when you have sales, you have to have some efficiency or process built into your sales to create profit. You need some kind of efficiencies. But now at this level, once profit is sustainable and predictable, now we're moving on to organizational efficiency throughout. Next level up is called impact. Impact is um, realizing that our businesses are not about transactions, but about transformations. It's the creation of community. So some people just buy your stuff because I need it. Some people buy your stuff because they say, I want to belong to that. Classic examples, Harley Davidson. You know, people aren't just buying the bike. They're buying the community. And then the highest level is uh, legacy. Legacy is the creation of a business that was designed and is designed to live on into perpetuity absent of the owner and founder. An example of this is like, you know, do you know the, the founder of Coca-Cola? And I suspect you don't. It's, and it's not Dr. Pepper. I've heard that a million times. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I don't know either. Um, and I researched, and I can't remember the person's name. I do know this, that Coca-Cola, at a certain point, the founder decided to make Coca-Cola a legacy product. I believe the, the people that lead Coca-Cola now believe they are doing good things. Um, I think they believe they're providing transformation. It's more than just sugar water. You are you know, perpetuating joy and happiness and celebration, connection. That's what I believe their values are. <clears throat> but it will live, it's lived on for a long time and it probably will for a lot longer. That's what legacy is. So that's the five hierarchy levels. I, I And it really makes a lot of sense because and there's so many entrepreneurs get stuck in that sales, in between sales and profit, right? And that's that's where they experience burnout and why so many businesses fail. And, and, and they try to do order and impact and legacy before they even have profit, right? Dude, I, I know a guy, um, a, a, a dear friend of mine, um, who his business achieved $15 million in revenue. And it was like, holy cow, man, for a small business, that's miraculous. And then uh, he pulls me aside uh, and he's like, I, I'm going broke, man. What I found is, it's crazy. What I found though is uh, sales, it's a vanity metric. Everyone knows that. But I, I, what I don't think we realize is sales translates directly to stress. And what I mean by this is sales is organizational obligation. I sell you something, now I am obligated to deliver that product or service. So that puts organizational stress on me. And as a small business owner, I carry the stress. It's like, oh my gosh, we need to see this through. So more sales is more stress. The balance for this is profitability because profitability gives our business sustainability. It gives us, uh, it removes that panic need to constantly churn and bring in money and play the cash flow game. It's a reserve that protects us. So it's kind of funny. Uh, I really am hesitant to pay any mind to revenue numbers. I, I go to these entrepreneurial events and people are like, I got a $1 million or I just surpassed two or I have a $300,000 business. I'm like, ah, great. I, that means nothing to me. Tell me about how healthy your business is. And that's when most people go zip lip and they're like, wow, <laughs> I don't want to talk about that part. Yeah. But that's the part that matters. Absolutely. Especially for the long term. So, so your books, Profit First, Clockwork, The Pumpkin Plan, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, Surge, and then a new one, Fix This Next. Where, of course, Profit First is in the profit part of the, the hierarchy. You nailed that yeah, one. Yeah, that was easy. Um, and then where's the other ones fit in? Okay. So I'll start with the back kind of working for it. So Fix This Next uh, is the new release that explains this business hierarchy of needs. That I'm considering my hub book. Um, and I designed it that literally you read two chapters and you understand, you should understand the entire hierarchy and find exactly where your business is. So there's a series of questions you can ask to pinpoint where you are. The rest of the book is now you know where you are, here's the actions to take in that area. But you don't need to read it unless you know your area you're in. So the kind of book you can tear through, it's the hub book. I, I, I used to go to people, if someone would come to me and say, hey, you're an author, what, what one of your books should I read? And I used to say, oh, read Clockwork or whatever my new book was. And now I say, well, I'm not going to give you that answer. Let me ask you, what's the biggest challenge you're facing? And here's the honest truth. I found that most entrepreneurs, the biggest challenge they face is figuring out what their biggest challenge is. So that's what Fix This Next is. Clockwork works at the efficiency or order level. Profit, as you nailed, you nailed the profit level. Pumpkin Plan works at the uh, sales level. It's a strategy for cloning your best customers, something I derived from studying pumpkin farmers. I'm a big fan of what's called biomimicry. Take what nature has mastered, translate it to a business and life. 
Surge is also at the sales level. It's a different component of it, but it's there. And then Toy Paper Entrepreneur, um, it, it, envelope, it, it envelops all the levels. It was designed specifically for brand new startups. And um, I, what I realized is the lack of resources that actually uh, it's, it has resulted in more successful businesses. And uh, it's, a, it's the analogy is, you know, no one's never survived the bathroom moment, even though there's one sheet there sometimes. of toilet paper. Everyone's figured their way through it. Uh, we just, our behavior changes radically to match the supply. Right. So that's what toilet paper entrepreneur is about. And, and what I love about these is, I think I mentioned it earlier, but you're solving serious problems for entrepreneurs on each level of the hierarchy of needs. Each book is like, you know, fix this next is, is talking about, I was just on a podcast or um, a mastermind yesterday. And one of the guys was like, you know, he has a successful business, successful podcast. And he's like, he's like, I just can't figure out what my goals are. And I'm like, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what do you need? What, what's next? Like, how's your business doing? And it's just like, I just can't figure it. And, and it, so many people struggle with that. Like, he can't figure out his business goals? <clears throat> his business goals for the year, yeah. And So, so that's funny. And it's, it's actually true for more people than they realize. I ask a lot of people, what's your goal? And they're like, well, you know, I did, just pick a number. I did $200,000 last year. So my goal is now 500,000. I'm like, okay, that sounds arbitrary. Like why 500,000? Like, well, it's bigger than last year and it's double the number. Or the classic is I had 100% growth last year. I want to do 100% again. No business can sustain 100% growth ever. It's never happened. Like Amazon has not achieved 100% growth year in, year out. If they did, they'd be a $17 trillion company <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. So here's what I found is, um, and I talk about and fix this next. There is this congruence we need to achieve between our lifestyle goals and our business because our business we started it i assume most of us to support a, a specific lifestyle we had a vision i want to live comfortably however we define that i want to enjoy my activities and then the business becomes conceived around that saying it's going to make me money to support my lifestyle and i'm going to enjoy doing the work i do yet very quickly we lose that connection so a great way to determine goals is not to look at the business, but actually to look at ourselves and say, what do we want for ourselves? And that's not even an easy process. But once you have clarity around that, then we say, what does the business need to sustain to do that? Just a, a quick story. I talked with a guy named Jacob Limmer, Jacob Limmer with L-I-M-M-E-R. He owns a company called Cottonwood Coffee, South Dakota. It's a coffee shop, two locations. And um, he's been around for, I think it's now 13 or 14 years. He's become a friend of mine. Um, and he's, he's been reading my books and I met with him and uh, I taught him the fix this next business hierarchy of needs two years ago as, as, I, de as I was developing it and wanted uh, to get his input on it. And he writes back and, and uh, he said, I, I'm, I'm be I felt I was beyond considering goals for my, myself uh, because I've, I'm so established. He's like, I've been in business for 13 years. I should be living at the legacy level or the impact level, you know, and, and, and living big. So he's like, I, I, I didn't want to do this. But every time I went through this analysis, it kept on saying, I got to figure out my own personal goals. I got to go back to the most basic thing that I should have done on day one. And he's like, I was re reticent to do it because I should have done this and, and I'm beyond this now. And then finally he said, you know, what? I went back and did it and it blew him away. He said the South Dakota lifestyle, you can actually live okay on $4,000 uh, a month of personal net income. Um, and he's got a small family. He goes, but you know, South Dakota is different than the Northeast, different than the West Coast. You know. um, so you can do that. He says, once I figured that, he goes, I realized that my business only needs to sustain uh, a certain level of sales, not what I was pushing for. It doesn't need more. And it changed his focus from, we have to sell more coffee and get more customers in the door to, we need to be more profitable on the, to the, for the customers that we're already selling to. How do we increase our profit margin? And uh, he was able to write his ship very quickly. And now the guy is, you know, charging forward. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it, it helps so much, but like, it's so easy for, for people, especially if they're not used to goal setting to get wrapped up in the busyness of their business. The, totally. the fear of like, Oh, if I don't, 
answer all these emails. It's going to crash. And then, and then the, what's so great about your hierarchy is that like, um, people are working on things that are so far ahead when they should be focusing on the sales and, and, and they just get excited about the next new project because maybe it can bring in like uh, the, more revenue when if you go back and you say, okay, like I need to focus on my profit. Okay. Profit's good. Next is order before we're doing legacy. And it just makes so much sense. And it's, it's really yeah, we um, talk about this in the book too. And so it sounds very promotional right now, but it's just funny because all these topics I talk about. As I was doing my research, I found that there is a compulsion for entrepreneurs. And listen, I include myself in this. I usually start by studying myself. And so this is my own compulsion. There's a compulsion to address the apparent issues over the impactful issues. Meaning whatever, like you, you, we go to work when in the morning, say, okay, here's the agenda. Here's what I'm gonna bang out today. Then you come in, you look at email, and then your whole agenda is out the window because there's a fire to put out. There's a request and demand from a customer. So our email is dictating our agenda, not what our impact and targets uh, you know, are, what our vision is. And that's human nature. It actually, there's a reward mechanism for accomplishing these little mini tasks because you get a dopamine re release when you're like, oh, at least I got to check that off the list. Yet it keeps us in this grind of every day just surviving. So we have to. Um, think past our neurological wiring for this dopamine response and, and really just focus on what will move my business forward most in the long term. And here's what I found one technique I found a few entrepreneurs do is actually physically remove ourselves from our office. So if you, I have, uh, I have six colleagues and um, we actually have a physical office where we, we're not virtual and we, we come in together. And um, if I go in there, I found that I'm, I'm, getting involved with, with their challenges and they're coming to me and, and my agenda is being dictated much more by them. So physically I remove myself from the office regularly about two times a week. Now I don't go in. So I don't have that distraction and my own colleagues. Now we're kind of virtualizing because some of them don't come in for about two days a week just to have the alone project time, but we still uh, get together because that social component is very important too. So there's this balance but we got to actually physically remove ourselves from our business, I think, to look more objectively than just looking at the apparent issues. And it's so healthy to do. It's so healthy to do. We have an event that we do in Thailand every year. And um, the, 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 the idea and the fact that people like remove themselves from the office in 10 days and they're in Thailand around other entrepreneurs, their productivity just skyrocket right and you have people creating six months of business revenue in 10 days because they're out of their zone they're focused they're around other entrepreneurs and we have one or two goals that we set for those I 10 days that. and it's it's really really powerful it's so fun to see i start as an, as an author so my, my full-time work as an author i actually have uh, for our little business we have a president she runs the business so my focus is to be a spokesperson for the business and an author so i do a lot of writing that's my primary job same thing. So um, I'm in a, um, a group, an accountability group, I guess it is. It, what we do with these things called writing sprints. And you call in and it's a Zoom call and there's like 20 authors there. It's led by a woman named Anjanette Harper. And uh, Anjanette will just say, okay, we're going to do our next 20 minute sprint. We're targeting 1500 words. Go. Everyone's on mute and everyone starts writing. And it's a silent <laughs> Zoom meeting where you're cranking away. I get more writing done during sprints than I do you know, at the office ever. Yeah. It's amazing how that works. It's really, really cool. Um, one thing that I want to do touch on that I found really interesting that you mentioned uh, earlier um, in your book, the pumpkin plan, you talk about how, <clears throat> I guess the foundation around business um, can be seen from pumpkin farmers or uh, the process that they use. So I have an agriculture background oh, cool. and, and so I use actually, um, stories about farmers quite often when it comes to business, because, you know, what do we do in the springtime? Like we plant, we we're planting our seeds, you know, in the summertime, we're nurturing the crops and in, right. the, in the fall we're harvesting. And then what are we doing after harvest? We're saving the crops and we're saving the seed through the winter time and we're resting, but also what we're doing after harvest is celebrating, you know, everybody, you know, the, the, the crops and we'll have a big festival and everybody will, you know, celebrate the harvest. And, and people have done this for thousands of years. You know, that was their system. Toys, uh, yeah. Yeah. And you talk, can you share about that, what you learned from the pumpkin farmers and how that was the basis of sales, right? The sales part of the hierarchy and needs. Exactly. So, um, I, I actually toured uh, through Canada, uh, with farmers and, um, 
met with hundreds and hundreds of farmers. I found there is a small faction uh, that make these colossal vegetables, right? So they're not traditional farmers. They're not in the quantity game. They're in the, this, this game of just growing the biggest pumpkin competitive. And um, I was really intrigued by them because they actually start off with not necessarily the identical seed, but similar seeds. But the whole evaluation process is different. So the, the ordinary farmer will say, they're in the quantity game. They'll buy seed as, as inexpensive as possible and spread it as much as possible because you want as many pumpkins to grow. The colossal pumpkin farmer actually will be highly selective of their seeds. They, they actually take a microscope and they'll investigate each seed to see the veins and strength of the seed. They want to ma- make sure that the um, seed matches the soil content, the climate they're in to optimize growth. So right from the early stage, they're highly selective. And so I translated that into business in that most business owners are in this perception of the we're going to win by quantity. Um, and I noticed it was interesting with traditional pumpkin farming, um, there's about almost a 50% waste. The, the pumpkins die off, they're rotting, they're not the ideal shape that people want to buy. So there's a massive amount of waste. So the only way to make money is you got to churn as much as possible. Colossal farmers, it's about the two or three pumpkins. Um, and uh, so in our business, instead of being in the quantity game, um, I argue colossal growth happens from being in the quality game. Are you doing something that's truly unique and distinct to you, that distinguishes you from the market, matches your talents, matches client needs, and so forth? And I have this whole kind of system to do it. I, the other thing I found interesting in pumpkin farming, colossal pumpkin farming, was as a pumpkin vine starts growing, the colossal pumpkin farmer will, will identify which pumpkin is the strongest and growing the best. As other pumpkins grow in the vine, they go through, I, I call it the kill. They go to the little pumpkin and they'd say, hmm. You're done. You're not. You're you're distracted. You're taking nutrients and water, uh, and energy and time from the colossal pumpkin, and they cut off the vine. They, they didn't look at the little pumpkin and say, "Oh, this is so awkward for both of us." Uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to try to find you a new location and a new patch. You know, but that in our business, we need to have that same commitment and loyalty to what's working. When a process is working, these little pumpkins will present themselves, and we don't call them little pumpkins. We'll call them opportunities. Oh, I have an opportunity to do this, an opportunity to do that. But it, it, it diverts our attention, our energy, the nutrients for our business, and it, it prevents the colossal pumpkin from growing. And I have these five cumulative steps, but how I, when I talk about the pumpkin plan, I tell people, like, there's only one guarantee I can give you. I can guarantee if you follow the ordinary process, you'll never grow something colossal. And the classic example is you can go down any country road, look at any farm, and you won't see miraculously have these massive fields, this huge pumpkin just growing on its own. The ordinary process prevents colossal growth. The, the colossal focus, meaning focus on doing one thing, being masterful at it, is not guaranteed to be successful. Sometimes I've seen these pumpkins, these massive pumpkins, they can grow them up to almost a ton now. I mean, they're massive, 1,500 pounds. Sometimes the pumpkin splits under its own weight. It's just too big. Sometimes other farmers who are competing against you will take pot shots with their shotgun in the middle of the night to, to you know, take your pumpkin out because they want to <laughs> win the blue ribbon, right? It gets pretty competitive. Yeah. I was watching these colossal pumpkin farmers and none of them said, oh, this process doesn't work. I give up. They all simply said, I guess it wasn't my season. And they go back to their shed where they're where getting the next sprouts growing and they pick the next colossal one. The process of focus um, does not guarantee success, but it is the only way to achieve success. The factors we can't control are the outside environment. So the, uh, you know, the, econ- the shifting economy, the rise and fall of competition, those things we can't control. But if we stay committed to being masterful at one thing, the day will happen when the environment matches up, the winds of the economy are right, the competition is in the right position that you can grow explosively. So that's what it's about. That's amazing. And you mentioned like you, you believe in looking at nature to solve, not solve business problems, but understand business better. Is there anything else that, that um, you look at or have you noticed in nature that could, you know? Tons of stuff. So in Clockwork, I wrote about, uh, it was fascinating. I'm, I'm trying to figure out business efficiency. And so I, what I did is I, I first started going to all these different businesses uh, and interviewing them. I remember going to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. It's kind of middle Pennsylvania going to a playset manufacturer that achieved $80 million in revenue making playsets. It's called play play systems. Something. And I'm interviewing the founder, this guy named Matt Miller. 
and trying to figure out the essence of their success. And he told me everything. It all made sense, but it was only scripted to them. Like I couldn't translate it to another business. And I met other companies too, and their efficiencies were specific to them. When I can't find that, that's when I often go back to, well, what's nature figured out? And I found in nature, the most efficient organization is actually beehives. Extremely efficient in its scalability. And it, you may have noticed one day you see a bee flying around like a window. The next day there's like this massive hive. How do they achieve that colonization and growth so quickly? And they follow a simple uh, rule set. And I, I write about it in Clockwork, but specifically, uh, all bees are programmed to take two steps. Step one is always protect egg production because the most important thing for the survivability and therefore thriveability of a beehive is the production of eggs. Step two is once you know as a bee that egg production is humming, you know, no pun intended, but humming along, you then go and do whatever your primary job function is, like collecting nectar or defending the hive. So I call this identifying the QBR. The QBR stands for queen bee role. In a beehive, the queen bee lays the eggs, um, but I'm not arguing that the queen bee is the most important bee. I'm simply saying she lays eggs, but all bees are responsible for the protection and growth of those eggs. And, and the queen bee is expendable. If she's failing to produce eggs, it's not like they're like, oh, stay around. Like they eat her. Uh, and, like, let's, and they spawn a new queen bee. <laughs> so in our business, I've discovered efficiency is achieved once we understand what our QBR is. Every business has a core function that the business is hinging its success on. Yet, myself included, I, most entrepreneurs never define what that core function is. have no clue. And therefore, we experience this two steps forward, three steps back. Because at times, we hit on the QBR. We, the egg production is happening, but we don't really appreciate that, how important it is. And we go to the next thing, and all of a sudden, the business starts slipping back again. We're like, what's going on? I don't understand why. So we have this kind of start and stops. So we need to identify it. And, and the, uh, one way to explain it is through example, because it's probably the best way to understand it. FedEx is a great example because they're a global brand. Everyone knows FedEx. FedEx makes a promise to its clients. Their, their primary promise is we will deliver your packages on time. Now, notably, FedEx also has print shops and they provide other services. But of all the promises they make, their core grand guarantee what they stake their reputation on is delivering packages on time. So step one that we all need to do for our business is what do we want to stake our reputation on? What's the one thing we want to be world famous for? That's step one. Step two then is we peel back the onion one layer and say of all the activities that we do, which one activity is the most important to make that promise reality? So FedEx you know, they have customer service, they do other things, they, and they have logistics, the movement of packages. Well, if we look at all these elements, customer service is, is significant, but to make sure packages are delivered on time, the promise, the most important thing is logistics. The movement of packages assures that. So what I argue is today, FedEx can make a declaration, say, you know what, we want to be known as the most friendly company. So we're going to be amplifying customer service and, you know, screw logistics, let the packages find their own way. You know, I would argue within one week of today, FedEx would be on the risk of going out of business. The headlines would be, you know, uh, FedEx, uh, extraordinary customer service, but they don't know where the fuck your packages are. <laughs> like, you know, like we'd be like, um, okay, I would never use FedEx. I'd go to, to UPS. Now here's what's interesting. I think the reverse FedEx could say, you know what? We're known for delivering packages on time. We're going to amplify our quality of logistics. We're going to nail it down so much so we're going to take our customer service department and get everyone out of customer service and everyone out on delivering packages and ensuring stuff is delivered. We'll never miss a single delivery ever again, ever. The headline will come out one week from today saying, FedEx not answering the phones, but every package delivered on time. And FedEx would continue to move along. They may be crippled a little bit, but they continue to move along because they're delivering on their core promise. We as business owners need to do the same thing. I, as an author, want to be known for, my promise is the simplification of entrepreneurial topics. So I make entrepreneurship simpler. That's my promise. Of all the activities, you know, we're doing an interview today. Uh, I will do a speech actually tomorrow um, and I write books. Of All the things I do, the most important is actually writing the books. If I don't write books that are extraordinary, I start to cripple the brand. And um, I need to put an extraordinary effort there to the point where the other activities like what we're doing or speaking 
has to be secondary to it. So myself and my team, all the bees, mama bee and all my bees with me, we all know if we are not writing extraordinary books, and right now I'm taking the responsibility for doing that. So if Mike is not writing extraordinary books, we're in trouble. So their job is to defend and protect the time for me to get that work done. And so for our business, that's my QBR is writing books. We got to figure out for all everyone watching now, what is your promise to your community? What's the one thing you want to be world renowned for? Then figure out the single activity behind it. That's your QBR that makes that promise a reality and always deliver on that. Final thing is you will have other activities you do. Those must be in the ballpark. You must do an adequate job, but you don't need to focus on mastering those. Just master the one thing, the QBR. That's absolutely amazing. I'm taking notes here because this is good stuff that I want to apply. Good. It's juicy. It's juicy. Ah, it's juicy. <laughs> it's juicy. <laughs> um, we should go smoke a cigarette out of the smoke, the wood shop there and talk about you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk about your business model real quick. And then, and then, uh, so you are, you're running two companies now, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, yes. I, and not running. I am an equity member of two companies and, and I'll tell you why that's an important differentiation. So I own a business called profit first professionals. These are accounts and bookkeepers who become certified in profit first for my books. Um, I also run uh, a company that's, that's my brand. It, it's for my books, my speaking, sponsor relationships, and other things. Um, I also have a, uh, an equity interest in an augmented reality company. I don't run any of them. And I, I think what's so important was, if you asked me that question two, three years ago, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I, I run multiple companies. That is a, uh, becomes a problem because uh, we start taking on the responsibility of running those companies when we say that we're running companies. I used to say I was an entrepreneur. So this is what I was trying to get to. I used to say I'm an entrepreneur and I love that term. Actually, I, I, it's my favorite word on this planet, but I also started to realize there's a trap in it. The definition, the, the colloquial definition of entrepreneurship is you work your ass off. You, you will do anything for the business. You will hustle and grind. And that's the term we're using now. I've come to realize that means, oh, you carry the business on your back. And that's a problem. I now say I'm a shareholder of a business. And just by really redefining that label, like if you're a shareholder in public stock, I own some Ford stock. Like, I, like when Ford sends a distribution check to me, I don't like say, oh no, I need to go to the factory now and earn this back or, or any of that stuff. I simply say, hey, I invested in Ford. Let's keep going, Ford. Keep sending those distribution checks. My business is as a shareholder, my primary objective is to get a distribution check. My primary function as a shareholder is to render opinions and votes. That's what I do with Ford. I write in my votes every year or every quarter. You can do some voting. But with my companies, I go to the president of those companies and say, here's my opinion of how to move this brand forward. Here's my suggestions and make sure that there's a bigger distribution check for everyone involved. That's my objective. So it's, it, it, and it was, has started to bring about is this continuity of, um, of the work I do. It's also availed me to do my passion, which is writing. So I'm a shareholder, first and foremost, of my companies. Um, I, do, I did decide to reinsert myself as an employee into the company as the writer, but that's who I am. I, li I like that because, you know, getting our egos wrapped up in the idea that we're entrepreneurs and we have to do so much is, is so easy. But again, why I like your hierarchy of needs so much is because it says, okay, where am I at that hierarchy of needs? Is it time to step away to, to let the business run itself? Like, That's right. Yeah. So it's, I write about this in Clockwork. Um, I, I believe in this concept I call the four-week vacation. And... Um, this was the ultimate asset test as I was studying all these businesses. And, and I always use myself as a guinea pig. So I, I started writing clockwork five years before it came out and I'm studying this. And I said, what, what, how do I know a business can run itself? And I found that for the vast, vast majority of businesses, if the owner can be removed both physically and a digital disconnect for four consecutive weeks from the business, the vast majority of those businesses were able to sustain into perpetuity that the structure was in place because in these four week cycles, monthly cycles, uh, a business experiences most elements, attracting customers and prospects, uh, managing our workforce, contractors, all that stuff. And um, problems will present themselves that need to be resolved. So what I encourage people to do is today declare a four week vacation for the future. I'm not saying tomorrow morning, that would be a disaster if your business is dependent on you. 
but maybe a year or two years from today, put it on your calendar, block it out. And it is a hard commitment. Then when you go on that four-week vacation, um, well, what will happen the next morning is you'll wake up and say, oh my gosh, I just committed to a four-week vacation. I better make my business run without me. So your mind will shift from doing work to designing the outcomes you want. And then when you take the four-week vacation, it's not really about the vacation. It's about the acid test. Can the business run itself? And there will be problems if you didn't fix everything or in advance and chances are you haven't. But then when you come back, anything that didn't work in your absence are the things you need to fix for the next go around. So I just took my, I just got back from my third four-week vacation, which was, uh, I just ended it two days ago. And um, it was revealing. My first four-week vacation was terrifying. My ego was like, I want to be needed and I'm not. And um, there were some problems. We fixed it. The second four-week vacation was so seamless. The third four-week vacation was like, this is going to be a no-brainer. We actually had more problems and more challenges in the business this last vacation went away than ever before. So I need to work with my presidents of my companies as a shareholder and start rendering opinions on how we can improve this for more seamless operations. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. Um, let's talk about, we're going to wrap up here pretty soon, but I want to um, just touch on, we've talked about Fix This Next quite a bit. Is there anything in the book or, or anything you want to touch on with the book before we kind of wrap the show up? Yeah, there is. I, I just want, us all to realize uh, that there is a necessity to get from your business before you can give back through your business. And unfortunately, but it's, 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 it's a good thing, but it's unfortunate. Many business owners I met with that I was interviewing were in this, how do I give mentality before getting? And, you know, it's, why, it's wired into us. You got to give to get, they say. You know, so my mom told me, you got to give if you want to get. But what I found is a business structure, you actually need to get in order to give. And what I'm saying is you need to get in more sales. You need to get in profitability to your business. You need to get efficiency built throughout your business in order for you to have that impact, the giving phase, in order to establish a legacy. So many businesses that I was studying said, um, you know, I really want to change my community or society. I want to do great things. And they just focus on this impact level. How do I engage the community and just have them so serviced? And they ignored profitability. They ignored sustainability and the businesses went under. Now, these are usually defined as not for profits. So they want to change the world and then they die in the result in the process. But sadly, many for-profit businesses are not for profits. So I just want people to understand that we have a responsibility to be profitable. We have a responsibility to have sustainable sales. And I'd even argue our customers are starving for us to be profitable. You know, my customers will never come to me and say, hey, Mike, can you rip me off and charge me more money? Of course not. But what they will say is, Mike, when I engage your services, I want to make sure you're around for me. I don't want you to be distracted worrying how you're going to make money for the next project uh, or the next client that's going to come in the door. So they want me to be profitable because they want me focused on them. So they won't use the words, but they have the desire. And we have the responsibility to focus on what we're getting for our business in order to be a great contributor. Yeah. And then if they're giving you their money, that's a perfect, uh, perfect result to say, you know, we want you, you know, keep doing what you're doing. We like what you're doing. We're going to Right. Their actions money. speak loud. Exactly. They'll follow their money. Yeah. Excellent. So I think we'll wrap up there. Actually, I could do another two hours with you, Mike, because I know like you've, you're just full of knowledge and I'm really enjoying the podcast. This so is a lot of fun. if you do decide you want to come on the show, your next book, whatever, you just want to chat. Oh, dude, you're fun. a stud. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, welcome. bro. You're welcome. I'm, I've enjoyed it a lot. And I don't say that for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so we'll wrap up there. Mike, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your business methods with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Chris, hey, man, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. And listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.